Welcome to the NBA DFS Build, a show dedicated to breaking down each DraftKings slate to help you build the best lineups possible. I am Kevin Roberts, joined by Taylor Smith. We will be going game by game, highlighting the top plays for the night on the seven-game slate for Wednesday, February uh, 7th. Do us a favor and like this video if we help you in any way. And if you want to see more of these videos, please subscribe to our channel, The DFS Build, so you get alerted for future episodes. You can also find us on Spotify, and that link can be found on our YouTube page. This video is sponsored by DFS Hero, which has a versatile lineup optimizer and plenty of features that can help you score a takedown. Right now, you can get 15% off when you sign up using our link, which is located in the, in the video description below. As for today, we have a nice seven-game slate. Taylor, how are you feeling about it? Literally haven't looked till right now, so we'll find out together. It's always the best way. You, you got you have fresh eyes. I did look at it earlier. I did a I did a nice little slow uh, early build, uh, but um, with news trickling in and and other things, things do change. So, all right, let's start it off with the Raptors against the Hornets in Charlotte. Toronto's actually only a seven point favorite. The game has a two twenty six total, which feels a little bit lower than it should be. Uh, starting on the Raptors side, who stands out for you here? I'm actually kind of surprised that Toronto's favored by that much. Like Toronto's not very good, but right. Charlotte's worse. So uh, RJ Barrett's back. He looks really good. Um, the salaries on these guys haven't really risen. Like Barrett and Quickly are both in 7K range. Minutes should be fine for them. Hurdle minutes got up a couple games ago. They got absolutely blown out the other night. He should see close to 30. I don't think he's a kind of a bad mid-range center for 5-9. Uh, and Scotty Barnes, like if he's going to be overlooked, I'm happy to go there. Um, Barrett being there does impact his usage, I think. But if Barnes is going to be unowned at under 9K against the Hornets, uh, I think it's interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, Scotty Barnes at 8.7. He has smashed in this matchup 63 fantasy points per game in two medians with the Hornets. So can't say anything bad about Scotty Barnes other than the fact that, uh, as you noted, R.J. Barrett is back. Emmanuel quickly has been in and out of the lineup, and he's obviously there too. Jacob, uh, Jakob, I said Jacob. Jakob Hurdle is here. So it's a pretty at full strength Raptor squad. I think Gary Trent is probable to play. Let me double check that real quick. Yeah. Yeah, so he's probable. Even Jonte Porter might be back. So they are at full strength. So that is the one reason why I would maybe not feel as good about Scotty Barnes as I normally would. Uh, worth noting, Emmanuel Quickly has a 20% boom rating, which is the highest for Toronto at DFS Hero. Um, I can't argue against anybody here. I don't know if they necessarily stand out as priorities to me yet, um, but I will say Barrett and Quickly both are too cheap for the matchup, for sure. And their projections are just okay. Um, but they feel a little bit light. I feel like they are probably better plays than they are currently uh, being represented as. As far as value, there's nothing really to see, see here when they're at full strength, so I'm not really looking at Dennis Shooter or Bruce Brown. Uh, it's mostly Barnes, Barrett, Quickly, and Pirtle for me. Over to the other side, the Hornets are still without LaMelo Ball, who is out. Mark Williams is out. Kyle Lowry remains out and probably will never play for the Hornets ever. <laughs> Gordon Hayward and Cody Martin are questionable. I feel like Hayward's closer to doubtful, but – he could, he could play. Um, so those guys being in would probably get us off the value here, um, but just give us a glean. Uh, either way, it might shake out how you feel about the Hornets here. Yeah, that's pretty impactful. Um, Hayward hasn't played in months, so I assume he would be limited if he's in. Um, he's cheap, but I don't really think you can play him. Maybe he's going to be held to around 20. Um Richards always kind of looks pretty good. He's always in the mid fives, it seems. And that's the casing in the night. Um, Hurdle being there does make Toronto a little bit better inside, but happy to buy low on him still. Uh, he, Brandon Miller, Miles Bridges get most of the usage with LaMelo out. Both look pretty good still for the dollar. Uh, the matchup's good against Toronto. That defense has gotten a lot worse since the trades. Um, yeah, Nick Smith, uh, Ish Smith, and Leaky Black probably aren't on the old radar tonight. I don't think, even if Martin's out, you know, I guess you could play Ish again, but the others, I don't know if you want to get to. Yeah, if Cody and Hayward do not play, I'll go right back to Ish Smith at, Ish Smith at 4.3K. He played 34 minutes, 22 fantasy points last game. I mean, I'm not expecting the world out of Ish Smith at this point, but if he's going to start and push for 30-plus minutes, he's absolutely going to be on my radar. 
Um, as far as everybody else, I think everybody else is just fine, like you mentioned. The only guy that I'd really prioritize would be Miles Bridges. Uh, Brandon Miller's price is coming up a little bit. You see those uh, Shaq and Kobe memes pop up on Twitter when these guys go off. They've been going off a lot lately. So um, Bridges just has the highest boom rating by far for this team. He's got the best projection. And um, unlike Nick Richards, who's carrying 20% ownership at the moment, Bridges and Miller are not going to be owned on this slate. So uh, I do like Miller just fine, but I like Miles Bridges way more. Moving on here, we got the Cavs and the Wizards. Obviously, if this game stays close, it could be the game of the night. It could be very stackable. Uh, on the Cleveland side, let's see. We have no injury news of note. So they are at full strength, which probably lowers Donovan Mitchell's ceiling. But at the same time, maybe not because it's the Wizards. So how are you feeling about Cleveland here? It's a good spot. I don't think anything would make me want to stack the Wizards in any matchup. Uh, certainly not a bad one like this. Um yeah, Mitchell looks good. Jared Allen is fine, but the others are still limited. Garland and Mobley. Uh, Levert, you know, with Garland in there, doesn't really look that good. It's probably just Mitchell for me. Um, yeah, the matchup's about as good as it gets for Allen, so I guess you can make the case for him, but he is still overpriced for, I think, what his role should be with Mobley in there. Yep, I agree. Nothing really uh, extra to add to that. On the Washington side, obviously you mentioned the matchup is not good. And it really isn't, but uh, the Wizards don't play defense and they play a little bit faster. So if this game turns into a shootout somehow and they hang tight, maybe we should be looking at Washington a little bit. How are you feeling about the Wiz? I do think Gafford is interesting, especially if he's going to be like contrarian compared to uh, Nick Richards with Marvin Bagley out. Minutes maybe come up a little bit for Gafford. But otherwise, they have a deep rotation with a bunch of shitty players. So I don't really want to go out of my way to play like Tyus Jones or Jordan Poole or anyone like that. I um, guess you can always make a case for Kuzma, but not the spot. No, it's not the spot. I will say Kuzma at 7.6. That price is nice. If you get to Kuzma as like your last mid-range guy in your lineup, I think that's fine, but uh, I would not be prioritizing any Washington players tonight. All right, moving on, we got the Warriors uh, in Philly against the 76ers. Obviously, Philly is Joel embiid less. So uh, they also might be Tyree, Tyrese maxi less. On uh, the Warriors side, Draymond Green, I believe, is probable. No, he's questionable. And the other probable is Aaron, uh, Andrew Wiggins. Might want to keep an eye on the whole, whole uh, trade rumor mill because uh, Andrew Wiggins has been one guy who's been thrown in there a little bit. So maybe he's not even available tonight. Uh, <clears throat> um, on the other side for Philly, like I said, Tyrese Maxey has an illness he's dealing with. Embiid is out. D'Anthony Melton is out. Nicholas Batum is out. And then you have Daniel House and uh, Marcus Morris questionable. Not that they matter that much. But obviously Maxey being out would be would be pretty huge. Uh, starting with the Warriors, who pops for you here? The best spot. Um, we've seen James play a lot lately, but with Wiggins back, perhaps the minutes come down a little bit for him. Um, Kaminga is getting priced up. Curry's kind of always the same. Not really the spot that makes him look good. Um, I guess Draymond and Clay's really cheap. Like Clay's been getting benched in late, uh, late in games of late, but he is only five five. Uh, Philly's not as imposing defensively without Embiid, of course. So, not a bad spot. I guess you can buy low with him, but it's not the most exciting thing. Uh, I think Draymond's fine if he's in, but. Again, doesn't really look like a priority. Yeah, I think if Wiggins is out, uh, I'd feel a little bit better about Pod Uh He's fine any, you know, either way. Uh, he looks just okay. Um, Kamenga still pops at seven two for me. His projections decent. Got, has a twenty percent boom rating. Uh, I just like his growing role, and obviously, like you said, Clay Thompson uh, getting pushed off the court to end games all of a sudden uh, doesn't hurt him at all. Um, so I'm, I'm also looking at Kaminga, and then I have no issue with Stephen Curry if um, you know if somebody up top like Trey Young is going to be chalky, or who else was getting chalk before at point guard? Let's check real quick. Well, that's actually not helping me. Actually, let's just I don't know. All right, let's go back. <laughs> okay, we're looking at ownership. Okay, let's see. cut all this. Yeah, let's see it. Point guard, it was – okay, Donovan Mitchell, Trey Young, those are the guys that could be – ended up garnering some ownership. Um, so, yeah, if Trey Young – or if Stephen Curry is going to be 
unowned, then I'll be pretty interested in. But uh, that does it for the Warriors side. Moving on to Philly, obviously Maxi is questionable, so he may or may not play, depending on what his status is. How do you feel about Philly? Uh, yeah, Harris looks good either way. Um, obviously, Maxi being out increases the chance that they get run, but more usage would flow his way. Um, I guess we'll be looking at Beverly, Jaden Springer potentially in that situation, which sounds pretty ugly. Um, Ubre with a two mount is viable. Paul Reed has been dealing with an illness. Minutes have been kind of wonky. Only played 22 in the last game. So perhaps he's feeling better by now. I don't think he's a bad dart throw at 6 2. Uh, those mid range centers, you know, Gafford and Richards, we've talked about already, look kind of interesting. Draymond Green in the same range. I think Reed as a pivot isn't a bad kind of buy low option, but. Yeah, this rotation is pretty barren, and it looks pretty gross with all these guys missing from the lineup. Yeah, I mean, if we assume Maxi uh, is out along with Embiid, Melton, and Batum, you see Patrick Beverly see almost a 12% usage increase. So I don't know if that's actually a good thing or not, but Bev would look pretty good here. Kelly Oubre gets a 7% usage increase. And um, he and Bev both look really good as far as like their uh, overall DraftKings production in those cases. So, um, yeah, I'm looking at uh, Ubre. Obviously, Tobias Harris would start looking like a core play even at seven seven if Maxi's out, and Bev would look pretty good. Um, and Maxi himself looks great if he's in. He projects really well, has a 19% boom rate, and does not project for ownership. All right, moving on. We have the Hawks against the Celtics. This one's a little bit tough to project just because DeJounte Murray is questionable. He uh, He's another guy who could be traded, so that could be part of that. Uh, let's just look real quick at who else is iffy for them. Clint Capella's out. That's the only other news. So, obviously, the Congo stands out right away. Uh, with all that news uh, considered, who you like for Atlanta? Yeah, Congo looks solid. Not going to get a lot of usage, and I assume he's going to be a lot more contrarian than he was two days ago. So, not a bad play. Power forward eligibility is helpful. I was wondering why Trey was getting ownership. It's because he's only 9-1. Uh, it's about as brutal a matchup as you can find on the road against Boston, but they have been a little bit more pedestrian lately. So, And Young typically has a pretty high floor if the minutes are there. They are pretty big underdogs here, like 13 points or so, which is a bit alarming. But if DeJounte is out, then even more usage theoretically flows his way. Um, yeah, Sadiq Bay. Bogdan Bogdanovich maybe look a little better if Murray's out. I would assume Bogdanovich starts. DeAndre Hunter went off in the last game, but he's still limited. So I don't really think you can bank on 18 minutes of DeAndre Hunter again. Um, yeah, Bruno Fernando. I don't know. That's pretty thin off the bench, but he does have a path. Say if uh, a Kongu falls into foul trouble, then Bruno Fernando gets a uh, minutes boost by a little bit. But overall, um, yeah, not a good spot. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I will say that Anyaka right now is probably a core play for me at 5'7". I know the matchup isn't great, but there's not a whole lot of really palatable value on the slate. And I like Trey Young at that price. I don't really like that he could be chalky again on the road against a tough defense. Uh, but if DeJounte Murray is out, that's a 3% usage increase for a guy that already takes a ton of shots and makes a bunch of plays. He does have a 29% boom rating too, so that never hurts. Uh, the spread is a little bit daunting, but like we always say, don't really play for blowouts. If he's going to have monster uses, usage and project that well, we need to consider him. Uh, moving on to Boston, obviously you have Jason Tatum up top. Worth noting, by the way, Drew Holiday is questionable. If he's out, it makes life a little bit easier on Trey Young up front coming down the court. So uh, it also opens up a little bit of usage for the other guys. Let me check real quick for Boston. Yeah, Derek White sees a 5% usage increase in situations where Drew Holiday is off the floor, and obviously everybody is getting a bit of a boost if that's the case. Although, worth noting, he's not like a majorly high usage guy in the first place. All right, so starting with Boston uh, from you, uh, who are you liking? Yeah, I think White looks good either way. He's just affordable for 6-5. The matchup is excellent against Atlanta. Atlanta's not getting any better on defense if Murray's out either. So White looks good. Um, honestly, everyone kind of does. Like the matchup is so good. Atlanta gets in shootouts every night. Boston has a, a 128 implied team total, which I, has to be the highest on the slate. Yeah, by a little bit over Sacramento. So there's a lot to like. 
don't think Xavier Tillman's going to be there tonight for Boston, so we should still see regular rotation minutes for Porzingis, Sal Horford, and friends. Um, Tatum, Brown, Porzingis all look better if Holiday is out. Holiday himself, I think, is okay if he plays, but he's kind of the fifth banana offensively, so not a very high floor for him, but it is a good spot. Yeah, you can always play Tatum. He's got the highest boom rating for Boston at 28%, but it's not like he's cheap. Uh, relative to Slate, he's fine, but uh, Jalen Brown and Porzingis look the best to me, and I'm with you on White. He's a totally fine play, even better if Drew is out. Uh, and let's not forget Peyton Pritchard. He'll have an increased role off the bench. Uh, maybe even would randomly start. You never know, but uh, probably off the bench. Uh, so if Drew Holiday's out, keep an eye on that. Moving on, we got the Spurs in South Beach against the Heat. The Heat are eight-point favorites with a 227 total. Uh, the Spurs do make um, any game they're in kind of interesting just because they don't defend really well. So we have to look at this game. So starting on the Spurs side, who do you like? I mean, I just laughed because Wemby's 8-8. Eight, eight. Like, what are we doing? He should be getting closer to 10K. He's getting further his, away. His price is going down. I know. It yeah. doesn't make sense. You know, 30-ish minutes, he still has a ceiling. So 8-8, eight, eight, like the matchup's tough, but it's like Trey Young. Like, these guys are just too cheap. They're being priced down because the opponent is good, I guess. But Miami hasn't even been playing that well lately. The eight-point spread doesn't scare me away at all. So fire up Wemby, I guess. Um Elsewhere for San Antonio, there's usually not much. I don't expect Devin Vassell, maybe 6'7", is not a bad price tag for him. But, you know, they still have Jimmy Butler on the other side. They can throw his way. Trey Jones, perhaps, kind of as a last piece value, but I don't know. Doesn't really have a massive ceiling either. So, as usual, probably just kind of win your bust on that side for me. Yeah, I'm in agreement. Uh, when everybody's healthy for the Spurs, the only person who stands out is Wemby. So weird that his prices come down. His projection's good, 33% boom rating. Yeah, and you know he's going to garner ownership, but I don't really care. I mean, at 8-8, eight, eight, he seem, feels like a priority for me. Uh, Bam is not an easy draw, but guess what? Last time, or the only time he faced him this year, 45 fantasy points despite shooting 36% from the field. So even if his offense is not there, and by the way, since we know he is not going to play max minutes here, do we really fear the blowout for Wemby? No, we don't. He's going He's, he's going to play and do a lot when he's out there. So uh, I'm not worried at all. Hopefully his ownership dips a little bit, so I feel even better about him, but I feel plenty fine. Uh, moving over, over to Miami, um, the Heat all look pretty good because they remain cheap. The only problem is they are at full strength. Caleb Martin is the only guy on the injury report, and I believe he's even probable. Uh, let's double check. Yes, he is. So they're, they got everybody here. Uh, except for Haywood Highsmith, that changes everything. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're at full strength here. So who stands up for Miami? I think Highsmith does matter. Like he had been starting the last few games, I think until last night. So Martin got into the lineup over him last night. He's projecting for ownership, but he is pretty cheap. And the matchup's as good as it gets against San Antonio. Um, Rogier also stands out to me at 6K flat. He hasn't had a big ceiling since he came to Miami, but... He has been playing pretty well. Um, still gets decent usage here on his new team. Still has assist opportunities. He's been hitting the boards. Um, San Antonio, I don't think will slow him down. So I do think Rozier for 6K is a pretty good uh, mid-range play. Butler and Bam, as always, look good. Um, for Butler, I believe, just because center typically has more options that stand out, and you're limited. Of course, you can only play two of them on DK, so... Yeah, I see a lot of merit to getting to Miami here. Martin and Rogier, I think, are the standouts for me. Uh, yeah, as far as value goes, I'm totally fine with that. I think Bam is the play for me, and I, I like Jimmy a lot too. I see nothing wrong with Hero or Rogier. It's kind of just one of those things where everybody's at full strength, and if you play them, you're just playing them as a price play with a good matchup and hoping they hit. Uh, but as far as floor and ceiling, it's Bam and Jimmy for me. All right, next game we have Pels against the Clippers in L.A., this game has a six and a half point spread. The Clippers are naturally favored. Pretty nice 231 and a half total here, actually. Um, looks like Zion is questionable. He got banged up last game, I think. I uh, don't know if he ended up exiting that game or not. He only played 22 minutes, but it was a 38 point drubbing. Uh, so uh, Najee Marshall is also questionable. So they could be without these guys, which means we have to look at JV and some of the value here. So what, what are you liking for the Pels? Yeah, these last two games start 
two and a half hours after every other game. So that's fun. We'll have a nice drought in between them. Um, yeah, Zion, Ingram, McCollum, all under 8K, McCollum under 7K. You can get to them as kind of individual dart throws. Obviously, Ingram and McCollum look better if Zion is out. Uh, Larry Nance is 3-8 now. He was almost the min the other night. Not sure I want to do that. Um, yeah, it's kind of just dependent on the news, which is tough because this game does start so late. We will likely not have Zion clarity in time. And the matchup's not a very good one. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard. I guess Trey Murphy's like viable as a value. He's four or five and still gets decent minutes. Even if he's not starting, he would presumably start if Zion is out. So, you know, if you can wait on the news, maybe you have a, you know, two roster spots you leave open for the late games. Trey Murphy is a potential value. Yeah, I think it's going to depend on what your interest level is in the Clippers and the other last game of the night, which is the Pistons and Kings that starts at the same time. Because, I mean, it, just like putting in Zion and leaving a couple extra hundred, bu- hundred bucks there and pivoting to McCollum or Ingram, depending on, you know, what, you know, what, whether he's in or out, that could be a smart strategy. But I'm with you on the fact that it's not a great matchup. So um, I don't know if any of these guys stand out as priorities at the moment. And obviously, Zion, if we knew Zion was out, I would like Ingram and McCollum and JV a good amount. Uh, but do we have to plan for that just to get like a little bit different on this slate? I don't know that we do. Uh, on the other side are the Clippers, and um, they look they, they are obviously favored here at home, so they look a little bit better than the Pels do, and they are also at full strength, I believe. Let me double-check. Yes, they are. So what do you make of that? Yeah, George probably limited until we hear that he's not. So Leonard and Harden stand out. Um, fine, kind of pay up to be contrarian plays, but I don't think either is a priority. New Orleans is still decent defensively, so... Not a ton for me here. I will be getting to a lot of Sacramento. So if news does happen to break here, then I do think I'll be able to pivot accordingly. But as of now, not getting to a lot of Clippers. Um, if I do wind up with extra money to spend or whatever, then perhaps I can pivot to Kawhi if you know Zion's out, for example. Yeah, well, I think like if you're already entertaining, like, oh, how do I get different? And can I get different in these late games? I think Kawhi is a really good way to do that. He's got the best projection for the Clippers. Um, not, he's not really standing out as far as boom rating or matchup or anything like that. And his price is obviously not ideal, but Harden's all the way up at nine K I'll just take unowned Leonard, who is a safer player when it comes to floor and ceiling anyways. I and mean, he's been crushing it lately in his, in his last six games. He has 46 plus fancy points in each one. And in three of the last four, he has 52 plus fancy points. So he is a beast at the moment. Um, it's not the most amazing matchup, but it's certainly one that he can dominate. And if he's not going to be owned, I will definitely uh, have him featured in my player pool. All right, moving on. This last game could be very disgusting. Obviously, if the Pistons can keep it close, it could be the game of the night. But it does have a 13.5 point spread. Uh, speaking of the trade talk we talked about before, there are trade whispers around guys like Bojan Bogdanovich and a couple other Pistons guys. They keep, like, trading. They just traded today for Fontecchio for, like, a second. Like, I don't know what the hell they're doing. They're getting, like, Gallo and Kevin Knox and – you know, all these scrubs on their team. <laughs> Anyways, so you never know what the Pistons are going to do. Oh, and Killing Hayes asked for a trade, so you just don't know. Um, this is one of those rare spots where I actually would say playing for the blowout isn't that bad of an idea because the Pistons are not good, and they're on the road, and the Kings are good, and it's such a huge spread. But having said that, starting with the Pistons side, who stands up for you? Absolutely no one. Yeah. Um, Knox being gone maybe clears more room for Burks. Uh, potentially, but you know, not excited to play 23 minutes of Alec Burks, even at four, six, um, especially if he's catching ownership is, um, is Cunningham questionable. Let's double check that. I believe he is. Yep. He sure is. And so hmm. is Bojan. Well, that's pretty big. Jaden well, Ivy. Isaiah Stewart is out already, as we know. Yeah. So Jaden Ivy Burks, I guess could become more viable in that scenario. If those guys sit, uh, ditto for Osar Thompson, maybe, but if they're in, I don't think there's much to like here. Um, well, I mean, I think you can just roll the dice with Osar Thompson at 4 4, anyways. So if they're out, he looks awesome. If they're in, they'll probably get their asses kicked, anyways, and he'll probably get a lot of run off the bench, which, by the way, he's been getting run, anyways. Let's see. Um, 27 and 26 minutes in his last two games. He crushed last time out with 34 fancy points. So, 
it's really not a bad matchup. I mean, the Kings are not always that good defensively. So, um, yeah, I, I think Thompson's the only guy here that I that I really would look at. I, I'm not feeling good about paying up for Cade Cunningham in this spot, especially since we don't even know if he's going to play. All right, last team of the night, we have the Kings, obviously heavily, fav- he- heavily favored. Their studs should look good because even if they do blow the Pistons out, as you always say, they'll probably be responsible for a lot of that damage. So who do you like for Sacramento? Literally everyone. Uh, Malik Monk's been playing more minutes lately. I think now, he's very good. Uh, Kevin Herter might be the chalkiest player on the slate, but he's cheap and facing the Pistons, so I get it. Sabonis and Fox. Like Fox is 8-1. That's probably the cheapest he's been all year. Uh, tons of interest in that. Sabonis for 10-1. Arguably not too expensive for the high floor he has. Trey Lyles is 3-2. Like You can punt with him off the bench. He gets enough minutes to get there. And if the game blows out, he has a path to more. So, you know, 20% on Harrison Barnes. Maybe I draw the line there. Um, but even he has a path to success just because it's Detroit. So, yeah, I don't want to play all of them together, but I do have interest in all of them individually. I agree with all that. You want to pick your spots here, but not having any Kings feels a bit wrong on this slate. Um, I will say Sabonis had 77 fantasy points when he faced the Pistons earlier this year, and Keegan Murray had 49. So take that what you will. To me, I didn't even it, mention Keegan Murray, but yeah, he looks great too. Yeah, well, the the guy who stands out the most for me would be Fox, just because eight one is just way too cheap for what he can do. So if everybody's gonna flock to Sabonis and the other ancillary parts here, like Keegan Herder, Harry Chalky Harry Barnes. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> uh, yeah, if, if that's where the ownership's going to go, I'm going to bank on this being a De'Aaron Fox game and, you know, the rest of the guys not really mattering. So, all right, let's close it up real quick here with uh, a look at the projected ownership. Um, right now, Caleb Martin is coming in as the highest projected guy. Let's not really go on him here because uh, we don't even know if he's going to play. So starting with everybody else here, you see, is there anybody that stands out that you will want to fade? Um, I suppose Clay Thompson, just because the minutes have been wonky and, you know, he may not even close the game. Not the greatest spot either against Philly. Uh, so if he's popular, I mean, I get it. You know, like he's underpriced for who he is, but perhaps he's not underpriced for who he is now. So uh, Clay Thompson's the one that stands out to me. Yeah, I, I like that. Uh, I think usually when you're looking at a chalky guy, you need to ask yourself, is there a good reason to fade him? And with Clay Thompson, here's a good reason. He isn't closing games. You can't trust him. Boom, I'm going to fade him. Or you look at somebody like Nick Richards. He's looking at a 20% ownership. He has a good price, but Jakob Pertl isn't exactly the easiest draw down low, and his projection isn't amazing. It's fine. So you can just say, can I just go get somebody else for five five to six or something that's going to be lower owned? Like as it stands, Anyeka Akangu is lower owned than him. So just pivot to him, in, in my opinion. So – uh, but yeah, I'm with you on those. So uh, to end it up here, let's look at the boom rating. Highest boom rating of the night goes to Wemby. Second highest is Sabonis, and then it starts trickling down quite a bit. So as you see here, these are the top rated guys. Which one are you building around the most at the moment? It's got to be Wemby, <laughs> just because the price is ridiculous. Uh, of this group, I guess Trey Young's the most fadeable because it is a very tough spot for them at Boston. Uh, but like I said, I have interest in Sabonis, interest in Fox, uh, Rogier, probably too cheap. And uh, Porzingis, I think, looks pretty interesting, too. I expect Tatum to be pulling most of that. Um, and Porzingis kind of as a decent uh, leverage option on the same team looks solid. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much with it here. Wemby is probably my number one play on the board. And my number two play is quickly becoming Fox. I think he's a really good leverage play on Sabonis if their ownership is going to divide up at any point right now, it's the exact same, but if they're going to have split ownership and he's way cheaper and they have the same matchup, I mean, I'm just going to go Fox there, but yeah, that does it for us. Uh, hopefully we helped you out with our breakdown here a little bit. If we did, or if later in that you find out we did uh, give us a like on our video and also consider subscribing to the channel so you can get alerted for future videos. Also uh, below, Check out DFS Hero, 15% off right now. You can uh, use the projections and hopefully help you get a takedown. All right, thanks for watching, and we'll catch you next time. Good luck.